just so you know, I, I'm Drew Weston. You're at, uh, hopefully you're at the right place from the brain to the ballot box on three principles of effective, um, effective messaging. Um, uh, can you, um, can you still see me as well as my screen? Yes. Okay. So, okay, so um, let me, uh, let me just give you a couple of housekeeping things here, especially because we're starting a little late. Um, why don't you hold Q and A to the end and I'm going to move as quickly as I can to leave, uh, to leave time at the end for that. Uh, from what I understand, this thing will turn itself off, uh, at, at 12.59. So I will try to stop by about 12.45, uh, maybe 12.40 if I possibly can. Uh, we're supposed to stop by 12.50, but it, I guess it gives us a grace period of about nine minutes. Um, a couple of other things. Um, uh, I learned uh, some, some lessons this week about, uh, well, the last three or four weeks about, uh, about uh, messaging healthcare, uh, which, um, <laughs> which I, will, I, will, I, I was not happy to have to learn. Uh, one, was, one was my neighbor who's got a big Trump sign up on his, uh, uh, up on his, um, on, in his yard, uh, decided to plant some bamboo, which uh, a couple of years ago, which has invaded my yard. And while I was, uh, while I was chopping it out, uh, chopping out the roots or trying to chop up, chop out the roots, I, um, I tore a, a uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I, I tore a tendon in my, um, my right arm, uh, and uh, which required surgery. And then Sunday, a um, while well, driving home and taking an Uber home, a drunk driver hit me and um, uh, and knocked my front tooth back and my other one through my lip. So I'm uh, I'm covering it with with uh, with some uh, hair growth. But um, uh, <laughs> so um, but I did learn some important points about our healthcare system, like with the surgery. I learned about how um, how uh, how uh, people struggle really with with even when they have good insurance, as I do. Uh, through a university, uh, I thought my uh, deductible was a thousand dollars, which it is. Uh, except that then, a after that, the insurance covers uh, seventy-five percent up to forty-five hundred. And uh, with one surgery, surgeon says, "Well, my cost left after your insurance will be about fifteen hundred. The surgical center says our costs will be about fifteen hundred. And the anesthesiologist comes in and put before putting me to sleep and says. Our costs are about fifteen hundred. So there was my deductible, and I'm lucky I don't have one of the ten thousand dollar deductible plans that half of Americans have, who think they have health insurance until they actually need it. Uh, and you, you know, you just think about what it, um, I wasn't happy to suddenly have forty five hundred dollars added to my monthly budget last month. Um, I survived it, but but um, you know, if you're on limited income, if you're if you're working, if you have a, the median income in America. Is thirty one thousand dollars right now, and uh, for 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 uh, for one employee, which is just above the poverty rate for a family of uh, a family of four, and makes you ineligible for Medicaid, for example. So imagine getting after taxes, you might get two thousand dollars a month, maybe twenty two hundred a month, forty five hundred dollar bill in one month, or a ten thousand dollar bill in one month. It is no it is no surprise. But over 60% of Americans who get medical bills end up not being able to pay them all. Um, we're having many fewer medical um, uh, people who uh, who who get um, uh, who have to leave uh, have to um, declare bankruptcy for medical purposes. But we're getting um, uh, we're getting many people who uh, who are just not paying not paying their bills and will have those bills for a lifetime, even even with um, what is called Obamacare and what I hope by the end of this this um, this training you will never again use that term if you've ever used it before so now let me get into the reasons for that are you um uh, are you all able still all able to um, to hear me okay I see that there's 79 of you let me just check check in the chat if you have technical problems by the way you should go to the chat uh, and I see the yeses thank you so much you guys are uh, you guys are awesome uh, to, to respond because I can't see you at all. Uh, so um, uh, I was going to have a uh, going to have put a laugh track in the background like Bill Maher does, but I, I didn't get around to it. So um, uh, the other thing I should just tell you as I zip through this is this is the first time since 
having my tooth knocked out that I'm trying to speak for an hour. So um, my teeth are clanking uh, up here. Um, my jaw got knocked out of alignment, uh, as well as my tooth and lip getting screwed up. But uh, so I, I hope I hope you can tolerate the the, the, the presentation anyway. So we're going to start with the the, the um, get into three princi principles of effective messaging. Principle one being know what networks you're activating. Principle two being speak to voters' values and emotions. And principle three being tell co being tell coherent memorable stories. And we're going to get to each one of these in turn. Um, I'm hoping that animation works on this. Um, are you seeing the entire, a bunch of pictures here? Or are you just seeing uh, where it says from the brain to the ballot box? Let's see what you are telling me. A bunch of pictures. Okay, we're going to skip that one. Um, Oh, put it in present. Oh, I don't even have it in presentation mode. No, no, no wonder. Uh, thank you. Let me back up. Oh, I, sorry about that. Thank you for telling me. Um, so we are. Uh, there we go. So principle one: know what networks you're activating. Principle two: speak to voters' values and emotions. Principle three, tell coherent, memorable stories. And uh, I, I, I should tell you that there are only three principles because I've learned now from testing about close to a million messages with about 100,000 voters, that if you break three of anything, um, you and you, you're doing online dial testing where you're seeing um, people are moving their cursor this way when they're listening to a message, if they like what they're hearing, move it this way second by second if they don't. What I see is for a thousand people, I see a, what you see on CNN during a, a during a presentation by, uh, you know, a, a, a presidential address or or presidential debates. Um, your modesty screen is up. Is it working now? Yeah. We can see it here. Okay, great. So uh, what I was going to say is that when you break three of anything, whether it's three principles, uh, whether it's three examples, you, the dials always go down. And it is you can get, you can get to you can be speaking to a group of evangelicals and get to the fourth commandment, and it goes down. Uh, and I can tell you, it is, there appears to be a, a limitation in our brains that doesn't allow us to get past three. And if you think about it. When if you are if you're in a relationship and your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, spouse, partner says, "Hey, uh, would you mind going to the grocery store and picking up a couple of items?" and they tell you a couple of items, it's a couple of items, three items. You say, "Sure." As soon as they get to four, you start to you get out your phone and you write it on your phone, or or if you're old school, you write it on paper. Uh, and it's the same principle with uh, that applies uh, applies with messaging. So be aware of that. What you can do, and you'll see, I'll show you is how you put subordinate um, under, under say principle one, you can have three things under that that are subordinate. People will then remember those because you've got them arranged hierarchically for them. But um, uh, I've redone all my PowerPoints uh, when I teach, for example, now, not to break three things within, uh, within one, one, uh, one PowerPoint slide. Remember that for your websites, remember that for, uh, for um, messaging material that you give out to people or that you send out or for ads that you're doing uh, for all these things beware of of loading people down with more than more than three so uh, here's a, just a, a um, before presenting this stuff I wanted to show you a brand new model of of, uh, of of how we get from the brain to the ballot box that I thought was exciting and is, is coming out in major publications now. It starts out with with uh, with the candidates and the the brains of the voters have to register what they think of the, and feel about the candidates. If they um if they have a a, a mail in ballot uh, with our new uh, postmaster general, uh, this is where it goes. Uh, if they uh, if they go to the uh, go to the polling place, then uh, uh, the the information is processed in this country, Russia. And then it goes to Vladimir Putin, who decides whether or not he's comfortable with the results. And then we have our next president. I just thought I'd show you this because it's very, very exciting. But getting away from the humor in this, 
there's something really serious going on. And I wanted to describe, because it's topical, the flaw in the progressive brain, and that is confronting aggression. Uh, this is a really important part of our messaging, and a problem with our messaging is that too often we leave out the antagonists. And President Obama did this repeatedly when, when he was messaging poorly. It was always because he didn't want to say something negative about him. So when he was messaging health care reform, he never said, there's a couple of antagonists in this story. There's a couple of really bad actors. There's the insurance companies and their CEOs. And there's the, uh, the, the drug companies and their CEOs who are getting huge profits and who are writing themselves big bonuses, but they're doing it by, uh, by they, they lobbied the, uh, uh, the Congress, particularly the Senate, during the, during the uh, development of the Affordable Care Act, which was developed in a month in the House and passed within 100 days uh, by an unbelievable speaker named Nancy Pelosi. And, uh, uh, but the Senate, the Senate was just riddled with corruption, uh, excuse me, legalized corruption or legalized bribery, and the insurance and drug companies got rid of the quote unquote public option, which should have been called Medicare, as you'll see, and they got rid of they got rid of uh, of the ability of the U.S. to negotiate with the drug companies prescription drug prices like every other country does, and like we already do through the VA. So um, that came, and then that led in turn the average American saw this stuff, and they saw the sauces sausage being made in public and they really really didn't like it and then uh, we lost the uh, we lost the, the um, both houses of congress and then uh, that was the end of of, um, of really putting through the affordable care act as it was intended and we've seen what's happened ever since so it turns out that uh, some of you know that i wrote a book back in 2007 called the political brain and the role of emotion in politics and um, back then it advanced the <laughs> It's hard to believe the radical thesis that uh, that uh, most voters vote on the basis of their guts and not their uh, and not issues, and that was uh, that was at the time uh, uh, in complete contradiction to the revealed wisdom of rational choice models in political science and the way Democrats were running their campaigns with their ten point plans, and uh, and in many ways we really saw it in action in. Obama running for president versus Hillary Clinton running for president. He ran uh, a campaign using himself as a charismatic vessel for, for what he wanted to accomplish. And he was a tremendous speaker when he wanted to be. I say when he wanted to be, because he also, he had many times when he shut off the emotion in his presentations and when he was really flat. Hillary Clinton ran an old style democratic campaign. I mean, there was lots of other stuff you know, I think I think it's pretty clear that the that the FBI director that we had at that time was the most invasive FBI director in our election since J. Edgar Hoover, and through the election to um, with his little stunt ten days before the election of saying, "Wait, we found a new computer that might have information on that 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 could show wrongdoing by Hillary Clinton," and then just before the election said, "Oops, I guess it didn't show that." The, the campaign did also did not respond well to that either. Uh, they should have responded with a very aggressive response uh, um, uh, to that, saying, get the hell out of our elections. You have no business doing this. If you're so incompetent uh, at the FBI that, one, that after examining 10,000 computers, you think you found one new one at this point that might tell you something different, you need to resign and let somebody take over. But you've got two days uh, to tell the American public whether there is or isn't something, uh, something that speaks to this issue, uh, or you need to resign immediately. That's the response that needed to happen. That was not the response that did happen. It would have been a show of strength and a show of for force. I mention this because we are about to have a, an election where the legitimacy will not be accepted by either side. And, um, and this calls for much more aggressive responses than we as, as progressives tend to be comfortable with. Because we like to say, oh, don't do that, that's not nice. Don't do that, that's not fair. Well, when someone's about to steal an election, I'm really sorry, but please don't do that, sir. That would be undemocratic. That's not gonna have any impact whatsoever on Donald Trump or on Mitch McConnell, because both of them are gonna require, require a tainted vote. Uh, uh, to keep what they want to keep. So 
it turns out, uh, since writing the political political brain, it's been a lot of, of um, neuroscience research looking at differences in the brains of Democrats and Republicans. I didn't intend to present this, but I thought you'd be interested in it because of events that just occurred. By and large, Republicans show greater mass uh, um, and greater active mass of, of the brain and greater activation of fear circuits that include the amygdala. In general, Democrats show greater mass and activation in circuits in the what's called the anterior cingulate back in here in the prefrontal cortex that weigh alternative facts, emotional reactions, conflicting data, etc., i.e., provide nuance. Well, that's a great thing. That's what distinguishes us from conservatives. Or one of the main things that does is that we actually wrestle with ambiguity. And we don't say, no, it's this way. God told me that life begins at birth. We say, well, you know, there's lots of different ways to think about this. And, you know, I don't really care what your God thinks because my God thinks this. Or I don't have a God and I think this and this is my decision. Um, but the problem is that Republicans respond too quickly with aggression and progressive respond too slowly, if at all because our fear circuits don't get activated the way they should, which means that they are responding with fight or flight responses, usually fight responses. And we respond with rational responses. Well, rational responses to irrational attacks are, are not effective. They are not effective in moving voters in the center. They are not effective if someone is about to attempt a fascist coup, which President Trump has told us that he is. So if you say nothing, for example, you allow the other side to create and control the neural networks, which I'll be talking about in a second of voters, and to control the narrative. For example, we, I just watched some panels on CNN last night. Do we, quote unquote, dignify the president's racist othering of, of, of uh, Kamala Harris? Do we, do we respond to his, his ridiculous uh, uh, pretend assertion or his except as well, it was, a very, it was a very, very good lawyer, very strong lawyer, who tells us that, uh, that she wasn't, she's not really an American citizen. She was born in Oakland fucking California, pardon my language. So do we, do we quote unquote dignify that? We'll ask John Kerry about the 18% he lost when he chose not to quote unquote dignify the swift boat attacks, uh, swift boat attacks against him that said that he wasn't really a war hero, that it was all a fake. Because he didn't wanna, he didn't wanna give them any kind of any kind of play. If you don't digna, if you don't attack the other side's message like that when they say something obscene, people will gradually believe it, in part because that's the only narrative they hear, and in part because they think you've got something to hide. So the way to respond to this is not to say nothing or is not to make one, one comment on it and then let the other side reverberate through, the, uh, um, through, the, through Twitter, through Facebook, through Russian bots. What you have to do right away is to say, um, this is yet another racist attack by this president, which is a, who is attempting, he is looking at a, at a highly competent black female who's running for vice president of the United States, who is going to, uh, going to sweep the floor with his vice president, who doesn't doesn't who can't hold a candle to her, and what he's trying to do is to say that she's some kind of other who's not one of us. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. President, uh, the white Mr. White President of the White Nation. We are a we are a diverse society. We were a diverse society in the 20th century. That every time we had you know we had that we had Italians join us, they were attacked. We had we had. Uh, we had Catholics join us. They were attacked. We had Irish join us. They were attacked. Now, now you go after Latinos, and now you're going after a black woman. We have always been a nation of immigrants, Mr. President, and your attempt to turn them into something other than us uh, is frankly despicable, and you're a despicable person to do it, and it just demonstrates that you cannot continue in the role of President of the United States. And every time he brings it up, you say, you know, you're just a little person, Mr. President, and you're looking at a big person, and it really bothers you. We should be, by the way, with a narcissist like this, go after his shame. He cannot tolerate. He cannot tolerate being called little. He cannot tolerate being called little Donnie. Little Donnie, you're doing it again. 
or I know you feel small, Mr. President, because you've done such a bad job of handling the pandemic that hundreds of thousands of people are dying because of your smallness, because of the smallness of your brain, your inability to say, to put the nation's interest above your small interest. I'd use the word small over and over and over with him. Um, how do we address Trump's telegraphing that he won't accept a loss and now is slowing down the post office to prevent one? I mean, you know, this is really dangerous, dangerous stuff because these these calls of, of Democrats of, well, you know, he, he's, he's doing it again. He shouldn't do that. That's not going to be effective if their ballots don't make it to the to the ballot to the um, uh, to be counted. I just want to warn. I don't like analogies to Hitler, but Hitler telegraphed what he was going to be what, what he was going to do in Mein Kampf, and I think that the president has been reading the children's book version of Mein Kampf because he's telegraphing in exactly the same way. He has exactly the same kind of fascist uh, fascist personality style. I don't think he's as disturbed as Trump, as Hitler. Uh, I don't think there are many human beings who could do what Hitler did, but uh, he's certainly a good, uh, a, he does a good Mussolini interpretation, verging on Stalin. Uh, and would he kill people if he could? Well, he's just, you know, we just had an object lesson in that. He let a lot of people die because he thought that opening up the economy would help them get reelected. You know, that's not doing what Stalin did, but it's getting awfully close, and it's certainly up there with Mussolini. We need to start branding every Republican who won't join Democrats on this issue of letting people in the midst of a pandemic vote or slowing, deliberately slowing down the post office as traitors. We need to call them un-American. We need to say, you are not an American. Uh, you, are, you do not believe in the fundamental principles that all of us believe in but you don't because the only job you care about is your own. We need to speak to them like that. We need to go right after those Republicans in the Senate, who, who only two of whom uh, said, nah, um, uh, said, nah, it's actually not okay to bribe foreign officials for your own, for your own purposes. I'm getting, a, I'm getting a, a message or two that I'm just gonna check on to um, make sure that, uh, that we're all okay. Okay, great. So, um, and again, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do Q&A at the end. I, I added this because I thought it was really important at this point in history uh, with, with the attack that just came on, on, uh, on, uh, on Vice President Biden's uh, uh, selection for VP that, that um, othering her, that we deal with this issue of our fear of aggression because it is crippling to us. So principle one, now we're going to get out of out of um, out of attack land. Principle one: Know what networks you're activating. We're going to do a little experiment. I'm a psychologist; I can't help it. What I want you to do is, um, I want you uh, to um, uh, think of the first. Uh, oh, let me first. I'm, I'm going to have you memorize three pairs of words. Okay. Um, so I, there, there does not appear to be a polling uh, option on my on my. Um, uh, on my dashboard down here. So I'll let you do this in your heads. So I, I want you to memorize the following pairs of words. Ready? Okay. Um, ocean, moon, table, flower, Kleenex, chair. Okay, do you have those? All right. Now what I want you to uh, think of in your head is the first vegetable that comes to mind. Okay, you ready? Um, uh, how many of you um, thought of broccoli? You can you can use the chat function if you want. Okay, we've got three. How many thought of asparagus? Oh, we got a lot of broccoli people. A lot of asparagus. How many thought of cauliflower? Uh, how many thought of uh, of uh, um, how many thought of grapefruit? I'm glad we didn't get some of those. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to ask you um, to think in your head of the first laundry detergent that comes to, my, comes to mind. Okay, you ready? How many of you thought of Tide? Why don't you indicate it in the chat?
I think it's taking a while to show up. How many of you thought of, uh, oh, 46, okay. Um, so 46 out of you already, that's, that's a, a substantial number, a substantial percentage, about two thirds. I can typically get somewhere between uh, 80 and 100% of people in a room that ranges from, um, and again, I'm sorry about, I'm lisping from my teeth clacking, but um, how many, uh, I can typically get somewhere between 80 and 100% of people in a room anywhere from boardroom with eight people to a, a, to a room with 3,000 people to say time. Now, getting all, um, uh, getting a bunch of progressives to think the same thing at the think, same time uh, is, it should seem, should strike you as quite an accomplishment. Uh, and I want to show you how I did. If we, if we did a little, uh, a little focus group and had time for it, and I would ask you, you know, why did you say tide? You'd come up with all kinds of reasons, but it turns out that most of those reasons would be things like, you know, I, I, I use it, or I think my mom used it when I was a kid, or uh, I could just picture that orange box or, or something, something of that sort. Well, there's a reason Tide actually has a market share uh, of, of uh, about 40%. By the way, important principle of messaging. I just rounded numbers. Always round your numbers. People will not remember 41.23%, which is the market share of Tide, or was the market share of Tide the last time I looked. Uh, and if you're if you're a social scientist, you know that everything after the decimal is noise anyway, and usually the last de decimal, the last digit before the decimal is noise. So um, not only is it is it inaccurate, but it is also distracting. About 40%. Now I can get about 80% to say tied. So what did I do? Well, I I said the word pair ocean moon, and that activated what's called a network of associations. That is a network of thoughts and feelings and images and memories that are unconsciously activated, even though you have no conscious awareness of their activation. So I, uh, I deliberately, I, I, the reason I threw in vegetable was as, a, was as a distractor task. So none of you would consciously be thinking of ocean, moon, and the other, the other word pairs that I came up with. So all of this is happening outside of your awareness. So when I said ocean, moon, it unconsciously activated waves and tide. I didn't say tide, but when I then said laundry detergent, it activated all fab, cheer, tide. You notice that tide is doubly activated, which means it is more activation than any other laundry detergent and therefore is most likely to come to consciousness. Now, why does this matter? Because this is how networks work. Our brains are nothing but, but um, sets of neurons, millions of sets of neurons that have been connected over time through experience and, uh, and uh, both, both through nature and through nurture and through their interaction. I mean, we have some that are, 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 uh, are, uh, are inborn. We have others that are waiting to have certain input. Like we all have attachment systems, which make us close to, uh, make us care about uh, our children and our parents and people who matter to us and we develop an attachment to them. Uh, our brains are, have been wired by, by natural selection uh, as have the brains of our dogs and cats, and uh, you see it more in dogs than in cats, although many of you will claim you see it in cats, but uh, they have it as well. But, but uh, uh, um, we've evolved to have that so that our brains expect certain, uh, certain input. And if we don't have that input, we actually develop uh, psychiatric disturbances like uh, Romanian kids in orphanages who were not attended to for the first five years of their lives. So why does this make a difference in politics? it makes an enormous difference. I want you to think of this. When I say the unemployed, you probably have some feelings because you're progressive activists. But what if I instead say, um, well, let me say what's wrong with that. When you say the unemployed, you are actually othering people without knowing. You're taking a group of people, real people with pain line faces and difficulties in their lives, and you're turning them into a nameless, faceless abstraction. You want to do the exact opposite. And so instead, people who've lost their jobs, or if you want to make it even, even go even further, people who've lost their jobs through no fault of their own. When you do that, you are activating completely different neural networks. In this case, you're actually activating different neural networks, which would, which would light up if you did an fMRI study or functional neuroimaging study because the unemployed activates these, these networks that are involved in abstractions up here, 
which are very distant from the emotion circuits that actually affect people at the voting booth versus people who've lost their jobs activate circuits up here, uh, right in the, in, the, in the tip of the frontal lobes and above your, around your eyes that are involved in processing feelings and thoughts and empathy towards people. Uh, so when uh, you should always use people who um, uh, constructions when you want to have people to uh, when you want voters or other people to have empathy for a group of people, you never want to refer to them as the something. It is always a bad idea, unless you don't want to, them to have empathy for it. If you want them to have, if you want them to to be angry at, for example, uh, the rich, call them the rich. Don't call them people with 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 you know, who've earned a lot of money or people with lots of money. Don't don't give them the people who moniker. Make them the rich and talk about things like the rich versus the rest of us, because the rest of us activates that people who network up here versus the rich makes them distant, but also adds negative emotion to them. The underemployed. Why is that bad? One, it's just like the unemployed, except on steroids, because nobody knows who the underemployed is. The average person, when they hear the underemployed, I've actually tried this out with, with my uh, students at Emory, and I've tried this out with a number of spoken to, to progressive groups and to Democratic, uh, state Democratic parties. Um, I never, I never shame the, the uh, members of the House or, or Senate in Washington by, do, by asking this, but I ask, can someone define the, the underemployed? Do you know only about 10 or 15 percent of my students at Emory, who are really bright students, and only about 20% of activists could do it. Well, why? Because when people think of the underemployed, they often think of, and certainly this is true of people who are not activists, they often think of people who just aren't working enough. You know, they chose to work less than full time. What they're not realizing is the underemployed typically refers to people who have to take two or three jobs just to get by. Well, let's, call, let's talk to talk about them that way. People are working two or three jobs just to get by or people who are working two or three jobs just to put food on the table for their families. And then you can add something like, that's not right. That's not okay. That's certainly not right in America, which is the richest country in the world. So when you speak that way, you can feel the difference because you're actually activating different neural networks. When you say 47.3 million Americans right now don't have health insurance, you are distracting people from, your, from the message. What you really want to say, because you can say it with inflection in your voice, is nearly 50 million Americans right now can't see a doctor because they don't have insurance. That's one out of about one out of six of us can't see a doctor. OK, you notice how I can put inflection in my voice. I can use my hand uh, to, to make nonverbal gestures that make this more seem more important. You feel it different. Medicaid recipients, knock the word recipients out of your vocabulary. Why? Because recipients, picture a recipient. What does a recipient do? It's not an accident that we think of recipients uh, at the same time as we think of handouts. I'm getting phone calls. I just want to check on, check on chats for a second to make sure we're good. Um, are we, um, can you still hear me and uh, everything is okay? Excellent. Yes. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, so um, uh, when you say Medicaid recipients, not only are you invoking this or evoking this, which is people who have a, or are looking for a handout. It's not an accident that recipients, you picture hands out and that we have the word handout. Handout has negative connotations, as does entitlement programs. You should never use that term either. Uh, you know, people, people who uh, people uh, use pay through their taxes for Medicaid. It is insurance that we all take out in case in case we are um, we're ever unemployed and don't have don't have health care through our employer, for example. Well, um, when you say Medicaid recipients, you are turning um, people who rely on Medicaid for their health care into people who are begging, people who want a handout, people who want something that they don't deserve. You're also turning people who are active into 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 passive recipients. And you never want to want to describe. Um, hang on, I'm getting some messages on chat. You never want to describe people uh, who um, who you care about and want other people to care about 
you never want to describe them as uh, as passive. You always want to describe them as active. Um, and and I just got a note about about activating a dependency frame. That's exactly what it does. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of these others because I want to get to other things. But I'll just give you an example: carbon emissions. The average person doesn't know what carbon emissions are. Talk about it as pollution that destroys our lungs and our atmosphere. And use that order of lungs and our atmosphere because people can get the idea that pollution destroys our lungs and the idea that it then goes up into the atmosphere. You're, you're activating a network and you're creating a network that's connecting our lungs to their atmosphere. That's why one of the most successful messages I've ever tested on, um, uh, um, and again, apologies for my, my speech is off, um, that, uh, that um, I could probably hear it more than you can, but one of the uh, one of the top testing messages I've ever tested on on uh, uh, on climate change was one that the my client looked at first and said, uh, "Drew, this one seems really off base. This sounds like a healthcare message." Is it because it began with, "My children's health is really important to," and then it went on to say, "You know, when one out of out of when fifty when the American Lung Association tells us that fifty percent of us are having our lungs damaged by pollution." That really worries me. And the idea that um, that that same black soot or those same that that's those same carbon particles that are going up into the air, the pollution particles, they're going into my lungs and destroying my lungs and my children's lungs are going up into the atmosphere. And that we're pouring 50 billion tons of black soot into the atmosphere. And we're being told that that's not going to damage the atmosphere like we were told by the tobacco companies that don't worry, this, this stuff, black soot, doesn't damage your lungs. You can't, I just can't believe that. That was a highly effective message. Um, when you, if you want to talk about our about um, politicians, if you want to refer to our our leaders on on our side, who you care about, who you value, who you want other people to value, call them leaders. Americans love leaders. They hate politicians. And the the, the flip side of that is that um, you don't want to talk about the other side's um, uh, polit politicians as leaders. You want to call them politicians. So some implications, and I'll do these quickly. I'm, I'm keeping my eye on the time here. Um, I'm going to skip over this, and I'm going to let you read this on your own. It's some really fun stuff. I'll just give you a couple of examples. That, that the language of activists and partisans is usually the wrong language for the public. Why? Because we as activists and partisans have different net neural networks by virtue of having strong attitudes, emotionally charged, we're highly engaged, we want someone else to feel what we feel. Uh, we want them secondarily to think what we think, but it is that feeling that we want them to get. We want them concerned about people with COVID. We want them concerned about people who don't look like them, but who are dying in large numbers. We want them concerned about what's happening uh, to our to our climate, we want them concerned about the fact that we could have windmills and wind, wind turbines and and uh, solar panels built at a much more rapid rate right here in the United States of America, America with American hands building those things. We should be using language like that instead of uh, instead of being built somewhere somewhere else. And I just say, if you want to convince a Spanish speaker, whose language do you use? Don't use our language. So when I talk to uh, to uh, um, um, to clients who I'm about to, who are who are speaking with me about doing a messaging project, I always warn them at first. Number one, I will never say anything that's not true. Number two, I'll never say. Unfortunately, on our side, we don't have to lie. And number two, I'll never say anything that uh, conflicts with my own values. I'm willing to go anywhere from center left to left. Because we're all we all share basically the same values, even though we have different ideas about how to get there. I mean, we have all these arguments, for example, about uh, Medicare for all versus Medicare as an option. Those are really are real policy differences. But the goal of both is to get everybody covered. And as long as you build in the idea that we start out with, we can't be a nation where anybody here can't get health insurance, can't get health care because they can't afford it. That is simply not okay. There are multiple ways to get there. The way I want to get there is this, you know. So I'm willing to work with people who who vary in their in their in where they stand. I'll often throw in messages that are to the right of what they like and to the left of what they like, 
so we can see what actually does best with the public in terms of, of, of moving the public. But you want to use the language of the kitchen table, not the language of actives. Don't talk about PPE. Don't ever use, uh, use acronyms. You never want to take your acronyms out in public. The average person doesn't know what PPE stands for. Talk about protective gear. Talk about protective equipment. You can talk about, about, um, uh, about um, you can use the full word, but don't use the acronym because it doesn't evoke any kind of feeling. People can't picture it. And you want people to picture virtually anything you say. Speaking of rights, I just have to mention, uh, Americans do not like the language of rights uh, applied to people who have not yet been granted those rights by us as Americans, whether it's as voters uh, uh, through, through, through laws or whether it's by the Supreme Court. As soon as rights are conferred, Americans are comfortable with it. So when you talk about immigrants' rights, you activate this knee jerk, well, who gave them rights if they didn't if they didn't come here legally? It's not a good term to use. Just as talking about gay rights was not a good idea before the the um, uh, the uh, uh, the Roberts Court, unbelievably, Roberts decided that he was going to be on the right side of history or the, the left side of history for progress, and conferred the right of marriage equality, which was a much better term than gay rights, and made a huge difference because it spoke to the idea of equality rather than rather than than playing into a conservative trope that gay people wanted special rights which is what George W Bush said as opposed to just they wanted the right they wanted equal rights and equal rights marriage equality is what moved people but something else moved people even more if you look at the impact of the Roberts court uh, in 2015 you can see uh, I, I, I pulled these, these, these things up from Pew, Pew uh, a poll from Pew, uh, not knowing what they would look like. But I thought, you know what, I'll bet after 2015, when it seeped in to the public that, that, um, that gay people now had, the, had rights to marry, that we would see a change. We'll take a look. After 2015, you see this, this increase of over 10 points. In the percent of, of this is actually about 20 points in the percent of, of Americans who supported marriage equality uh, within two years. Uh, you see over here that after 2015, there was a huge jump in in among Democrats and Democrat lean, Democrat leaners. There was an even bigger jump among Republicans. But it occurred to me we had a uh, we had a phenomenal um, uh, guy who who will probably would prefer to go unnamed who worked with the Screenwriters Guild to get the screenwriters not to agree, to agree that they would not um, uh, write for any show that, uh, that didn't portray uh, gay people and didn't portray them in a way that was positive. Whether it was, you didn't know they were gay until you saw them partner up. And then they would do things like have the same problems in their relationships and the same joys in their relationships that straight people did or they were stereotypical, as in modern family, but they were lovable. And, and it was a, a technique that, that Norman Lear pioneered with a show called All in the Family back in the 60s and 70s uh, about a lovable racist, Archie Bunker, un unlike the un unlovable racist in the White House. It was actually a lot like him, except without the lovability. And the, the, um, uh, the point of, of, of what the Screenwriters Guild, I cannot overemphasize, uh, over the importance of their making that decision and essentially bringing lovable gay characters into the lives and living rooms of people across America, regardless of where they stood politically. Um, and I just thought I would take a look because there is a, a similar jump starting at 2009. Look at this huge jump in favorability towards marriage equality. And you see it starting in 2009 among Republicans, this huge jump, and then another, another bump with the Roberts Court. And I had an idea what that might be about. So I checked it out on Google, and sure enough, that 2015 was all about John Roberts. 2009 was when Modern Family came on the air. So you can thank Modern Family and then Grey's Anatomy, which had a, showed a lesbian couple, both dealing with issues in relationships and then ado adopting children or having their own children uh, that, um, that really changed the, changed the landscape. And we need to be doing this on a 
abortion. We need to be doing it on climate change. Uh, I noticed that the show, um, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, in started introducing issues of climate change. Uh, we've seen many interracial couples uh, represented on television. We are probably hitting a point where there are too many because it's now starting to become too obvious that Hollywood is portraying interracial couples at a higher rate than you see them in the population. And the reason I say that's a bad idea is because when it becomes obvious and conscious, it starts influencing people to have to let to, uh, to push back. Whereas seeing lovable gay characters on shows was something that started to introduce it in a way that was that was that made people comfortable. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the allotted time, and I want to leave time for Q and A. Um, but may have to, there's some, some way that, um, that I'm supposed to be able to um, create a chat room for the next half hour if we want it, but um, uh, I can't find it while I'm screen sharing. Um, uh, I'll, what I'll try to do is, I'll try to figure out a way, but, but um, let me, let me uh, skip over this and um, just mention our biggest systemic problem on the left. And that is that, we, that well, I, I can't do that without this. Some, some rules of thumb. Whenever we respond to language on the right with, oh, that's stupid, assume it isn't. Um, illegal aliens made, made immigrants who had crossed the border for whatever reasons, whether they were seeking asylum, by the way, don't use asylum speakers, seekers. People don't know that, that's, that those are not economic refugees. Those are political refugees. Those are people who are fleeing death in another country or torture in another country. You call them asylum seekers, you are again otherizing them in a way that you don't want to do. You're taking the empathy towards people who've seen their brother or sister or their father shot in front of them or tortured. You're taking the feeling that any normal person has towards them and turning them into someone else. Well, making them illegal aliens was like making them space creatures on steroids. Um, Death panels. Uh, the response to that was, oh, that's stupid. Wasn't stupid at all. Uh, healthcare reform is socialized medicine. You know, what's being proposed is anything but socialized medicine. It is, hey, let's have some minimum standards and regulate capitalism, uh, like the ACA, the, the ACA, which you should not call it, uh, uh, or, or Obamacare, call it, which you should not call it. What, but what, it's what that what healthcare reform uh, uh, started to do was anything but socialized medicine. It was regulated capitalism, and it was giving insurance companies a website where they could sell their wares. That was a little overly uh, uh, overly generous to the to the health insurance companies. And we absolutely have to have Medicare and Medicaid on as alternatives that people can have in the exchanges, particularly exchanges that are lacking private insurance. If conservatives are repeating a word, phrase, or meme, they know it works because they've tested it. Um, if progressive are, are repeating a word, phrase, or meme, it usually means one of three things. One, conservatives gave it to them. They gave us Obamacare. It's a conservative frame. You do not want to use it. Why? Because you may love Obama as much as you want to. We, we all love Obama. It's great that we love Obama. History will remember him as the president. Who, who, uh, who finally introduced healthcare reform that started to and would have and will, if Joe Biden is, is elected, uh, will give us universal health coverage, another term we should not use. But, um, but we'll, we'll make sure that, that no, one, uh, no one again is without a doctor, okay? Uh, but when you say Obamacare, it's like when I, landed in, when I land in Reagan National Airport, it just gives me the creeps. So, uh, so people can like Obama, uh, um, can like their the health care their coverage they're getting through Obamacare, but they'll say they hate Obamacare. And it's because if you name anything after a president, it will automatically turn off 45% of voters. Don't do it. Resist the temptation. Call it a family doctor for every family. You know, George W. Bush called his education initiative No Child Left Behind. How do you argue with that? I'm against no child left behind. Really, you want to leave children behind? How do you? How are you going to be against a family doctor for every family? Good luck on that one. I can tell you, it tests unbelievably well. We got we got um, uh, working on healthcare in two thousand in messaging in two thousand seven two thousand eight. We got it up to seventy percent with 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 
by framing it as and activating the neural networks that go along with things like a family doctor for every family, which by the way, universal healthcare in contrast only got us to 50%, even if we use the exact same message after uh, following it with, I believe in a family doctor for every family versus I believe in universal healthcare and followed it with the same message. Um, imagine, fortunately, most of you probably don't remember who gave us Medicare. Um, imagine if it had been called Johnson Care. First of all, it sounds like something used by proctologists or urologists, but it also, uh, it also, what would people have said? You can imagine, oh God, they're gonna give me injections of Agent Orange. People didn't like Lyndon Johnson because of his foreign policy, which is a really sad, sad thing because on the domestic front, he was probably the greatest president since FDR. But, uh, so that's one reason progressives usually use a word. Second reason was it was good language 50 years ago. And the other is it resonates with them, but they haven't tested it. Uh, Republicans, if you want to talk about, about our biggest systemic problem on the left, other than, other than racism, uh, which is the systemic problem for our country, that is that Republicans govern with intuition, and which is why they govern horribly, but they run with science. They test every word that they use. Democrats tend to run with science, to govern with science, which is why we govern well, but we run with intuition. Our campaigns are not based on good science. And, you know, I, I'm always saying to progressive audiences and to progressive campaigns, if you value science behind policy, use the same rigor to test your messages before you ever utter them. We should test the names of, say, 10 possible names for every bill before we put it out there in Congress. Um, we should have a, have a brief handbook of progressive messaging in the, hand, in the hands of every candidate, staffer, and activist based on empirically tested messaging, podcasts and down downloadable PDFs that you can listen to, and include the background to every issue, language to use and avoid, empirically tested narratives, something I'm, I'm, I'm working on trying to get funding now for, for, for this election cycle. We'll see if it can happen. But every candidate should have on healthcare reform something like this that says, instead of saying the uninsured, say this. Instead of saying the underinsured, say this. Instead of saying the ACA, ACA, Universal Healthcare, Obamacare, say this. Um, I'm going to have to skip over this, and um, and I believe we have hit our time. We're about to about to end. We got through one principle. You'll have to read the other principles uh, in, in the deck, but they are there in the in the in the deck that you'll be able to read. Um, it was a pleasure talking at you. I wish I could have talked with you. Had a little bit of a late start, and there's a lot, a, a lot to cover. But I hope this was um, uh, was useful to you. And um, uh, if anyone knows the way we can continue by chat, um, I'm getting some questions about how to get the slides. Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but someone at Netroots will. Uh, so if you ask them, oh, uh, we met briefly at a mixer at the America's Future Con Conference. Um, oh, my my email address uh, I will put up. It, it's at the top of these slides, so I'm going to exit. Um, um, does someone know? Uh, does our um, our um, moderator uh, expert person know um, the email address? Let me see if I can if I can get out of this, um, so I can get back up to slide one faster than I'm about to do. Uh, my email address is is d weston d w e s t e n at westonstrategies.com. Um, there it is. This is uh, this is the one I use for politics. I've got an academic one as well, but. Um, this is my email address. If you want to contact me, I would love to hear from you. Um, uh, thanks for the very kind con comments I just got from a few people. And, and uh, those of you who have unkind contacts. Uh, con um, oh, it's Weston with, Weston with an E-N. Uh, those of you with, with unkind comments, I very much appreciate you not having sent them uh, in an unkind way. <laughs> so um, I am on Twitter. Um, uh, and I will find out from Netroots how to get you the slides. And why don't you ask them as well? Uh, and good luck to you all. And I will 
hopefully have this handbook of podcasts uh, that could get to you all as well. But um, I'll see. I'm still working on trying to get the trying to get the funding for it. Got a couple of new messages. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being there. Take care, everyone. And again, thanks for making it through my lispy voice. Uh, and thank you for the wish for the speedy recovery. I feel I, I appreciate that. Take care, everyone. I believe they're about to cut us off. You know, while they're not, if we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, we're getting Q and A, and we'll see how long we have. But why don't I, why don't I take a look at the Q and A? Um, okay, so how can we follow follow your future panels, etc., our speaking engagements? Um, are you active on social media? Yes, I'm active on. Facebook, somewhat active on Twitter, um, uh, active on, um, somewhat active on, on um, LinkedIn, uh, not terribly active on Instagram, but we'll probably get more active. Um, that's one way. Uh, let's see. Other questions. Uh, uh, there's a question about um, how does George Lakoff's book relate to your research? Uh, really good question. Uh, George's work, in many ways, inspired me to write the political brain. The biggest, di and 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 I think it's I think uh, George is really brilliant at describing the problem. Uh, the solutions he suggests are often a little distant. They're often a little abstract. Um, but the but but his um, his ability to cut through what is the frame and what's and how are they framing this and how should we frame it. It's really, really important. The biggest difference, I guess, is the focus on uh, on networks, which are a little bit broader because they include all this, these unconscious associations. And you can have, for example, within the same frame, most people have conflicting networks. You can talk about them as conflicting frames and get to the same place. Um, I've found um, that it's really important with, um, with uh, in testing messages um, to look for, um, things like order effects that networks tell you about that frames don't. For example, if you're talking about immigration, it's really useful to say, look, you know, what I really don't like is politicians who prey on both our legitimate concerns and our prejudices. If you say that, the dials go straight up like this with, with, uh, Republican, with independents who lean Republican, with Republicans who identify as weak Republicans. And that's, that's as well as everybody to the left. And that is 60% of the population. Um, if you instead say, uh, what I really don't like is, is, is politicians who prey on our prejudices, the dials go straight down. And if you say, I don't like, I, what I really don't like is, is politicians who prey on our, our prejudices and our legitimate, legitimate, legitimate concerns, dials go straight down. You have to first say that prey on our on our on our legitimate concerns as well as our prejudices. What you're then doing is you're bringing everyone who's right with you. They then they hear that you're saying, yeah, there's legitimate concerns about having borders that are porous. I mean, obviously there are legitimate concerns about that. At the same time, it's preying on our prejudices. They go, yeah, of course it is. And then you can then you can go into saying, you know. Our parents and grandparents all knew what it was like to come to a country where they didn't speak the language. It was it's really hard to learn the language as an adult. They tried just like immigrants today do, including undocumented immigrants. They all want to learn English. In fact, we could create tens of thousands of good American jobs by getting people who are bilingual to offer to, to have uh, paying them to offer classes to people uh, who are coming from other countries uh, to teach them English because no one wants to be a stranger in a strange land where they can't speak it. You know, our, our grandparents understood what it was like to face prejudice, um, just just like immigrants today are facing it, documented as well as un, un, undocumented. Um, when you do that, you're creating an us uh, where before there was a them. And whoever controls us and them controls the narrative. I can't emphasize the, the, um, uh, the, the importance of that, uh, is that um, don't let the other side def just define the problem as people of color versus white people. Make it about working people and people who, uh, and the rich versus the rest of us. 
make it, make it about people who earn their money uh, by just collecting uh, collecting money from the stock market uh, and then getting lobbyists to cut their taxes to do that so they don't have to pay taxes on it or they can pay 20% taxes while the rest of us are paying 30 uh, you know 30 to 40% taxes that's not right make it about the rich versus the rest of us and then that 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 puts together the rest of us is every color there is and every shade there is um gets to another important issue where when you're talking about abortion we always talk about that as a women's issue but let me say tell you as a man i've thought about birth control every time i've had sex with somebody you know I'm not necessarily that second i might have been hopefully a little more prepared but but the the uh, you know uh, contraception is not just a women's issue and we really turn off men unnecessarily in this you can say for example a woman's right to choose you have immediately disenfranchised 50 percent of the population who actually believe that if if they get a woman pregnant they either do or don't have responsibilities but they also either do or don't want to be involved and um that doesn't mean they get to make the decision but you know the, when you say a woman's right to choose people don't realize you're activating a network about a single woman who's who's deciding not to have a child out of wedlock uh which activates networks you do not want to activate with conservative leaning voters or frankly with you don't want to activate them with most dads who unconsciously will be thinking well i'm sure hope that's not my daughter instead you know, you want to activate the networks about the majority of abortions, which are actually in women who are married, uh, which nobody nobody seems to know because we don't tell them about it. That the average the average abortion is in a woman in her in her forties or late thirties who already has kids with her husband, who they can't afford more, and it was an accident. And God bless them. After twenty years of marriage, uh, they were excited enough about each other that they had an oops moment. Well, now they had an oops moment. What do they do? So instead, if you say something like this, this sounds conservative, but see where it leads. You know, I don't care whether you call me pro-choice, pro-life, or, or, or pro-common sense, but I just don't like the idea of the government telling a woman or couple when they should or shouldn't start their family. Well, I've just said something that I can tell you win 60-40 in Georgia, right? In the, in the heart of the Deep South, that message on abortion wins. And it's because I've number one, I've taken, I've said, I don't like the idea of the government telling women or couples when they should or shouldn't start their family. It's now about family. It's and family is a really, really powerful frame. It's a really, really powerful value for evolutionary reasons. Um, you're also now making it about it's not about God's right to choose versus a woman's right to choose. It's about when you can and can't start your family. Um, you're also now flipping it you're taking that conservative frame of government intervention and you're turning it against against conservatives where we should have turned it years ago because they are always saying big government big government well you know the most intrusive invasive government is virtually always at the local level and i don't care to have my neighbors here in georgia tell me or my girlfriend uh, or my wife if i were married when we should or shouldn't have kids it's none of their goddamn business, no matter what their God believes or they believe their God believes. So, um, you know, they can take their God, shove their, shove their God, never mind. But you get the point. I wouldn't use that as messaging. But I would say, I don't like the idea of government telling a woman or a couple when they should or shouldn't start their family. Simply another way of talking about choice uh, that is much more effective. I believe we are probably cut off at this point. Um, but, um, but thank you all for joining and um and um best of luck to you in this election and going forward and um uh and onward and upward let's win this one thank you drew i wish i was more um i wish i was more helpful this is the first time i've done this <laughs>